a few weeks ago, I was giving this workshop to a group of primary teachers, about 30 teachers, about the brain and learning. And then afterwards, this lady comes up to me and she says, oh, well, thank you, it was a really great lecture. I now suddenly realize that my students do not remember everything I tell them. So I stood there looking a bit puzzled, I guess, and she said, well, of course, I know that we don't remember everything we hear, but I never consciously thought about this in relation to my education. I mean, it has never changed the way I teach. You might have seen some form of the other of this pyramid of learning, and it states that we remember 10% of what we hear, 20% of what we read, until about 90% of what we teach to others. And there's a lot of people that have criticism on this pyramid, well, including me, but the main message is correct. The more actively you process information, the better you remember it. So why is it that our children in school still spend so much time just listening and reading, while they could be making more challenging assignments? Assignments that stimulate them to think in a, in a more creative and curious and active way. Well, the answer lies in teachers' attitudes. If you're a teacher, what kind of teacher are you? Do you hope and expect your students to remember and understand everything you tell them? Or do you coach them and help them to discover and figure things out by themselves? What is your attitude? Teachers' beliefs and how they think about education has major impact on how they, how they act in the classroom, how they interact with children. And just knowing that active learning is beneficial doesn't change these beliefs. Teachers need to understand why. And that is where the brain comes in. There are two things that shaped my view on education. That's my experience as a student of psychology and my knowledge about the brain. I love to learn. But as a child, and well, especially as a teenager, I was really unmotivated. And I was even thinking of dropping out of high school and working in a video store. I just, I mean, I didn't care about school, I didn't have the feeling that we were learning anything valuable, so why would I go? But after having a job interview at the video store and realizing that the most challenging thing of working in a video store is pronouncing the English titles correctly, I decided to finish high school and I decided to go to university. And there, in university, I was finally challenged. You know, I became motivated to learn again, and I became e eager to learn. And I went to a university which used a type of education called problem-based learning. It's really activating and it's really challenging. And there, for the first time, I had the feeling that it was appreciated by the teachers that I was actually using my brain. And that's the feeling that education should give you. Well, the second thing that shaped my view on education is my knowledge about the brain. But as a, as a brain scientist, I actually never connected this to education. I only started realizing that this knowledge shapes my view on education when I started working for a different university, one without problem-based learning. And they were dealing with many unmotivated students. You know, they never seemed to graduate or they just dropped out. And they, they felt that they had to, uh, had to change and they were discussing how. But instead of talking about the core business of education, learning and how to teach in order to learn, they were discussing all kinds of things that didn't have anything to do with learning. I mean, they were discussing how many attempts a student should get in order to pass the test, or how many hours they should be present in university. Well, around the same time, my oldest daughter started primary school. And to my amazement, the same thing was going on there. I mean, the school felt the, the urge to change, but instead of talking about learning and how to teach in order to learn, they were discussing things like class sizes or class management or cooperation without ever discussing how this would be beneficial for learning. I mean, the word child or learning never entered the discussion. It almost seems like they're lacking a language to talk about these things. I mean, think about fishermen standing on the side of a lake and trying to increase the number of fish, fish they catch. They can talk about you know, a thousand things. They can, um, for example, uh, what angle to throw the rod or how long it should be. Maybe what kind of chair to sit on or what color shirt to wear. But it's not going to help if they're not going to think about what is happening under the surface of the water. They have to think about the behavior of the fish. And the same holds for education. You have to think about what is happening inside the heads of your students 
if you want your students to become better learners. I met a lot of teachers that are really skeptic about the use of, of brain science in education. And most of them, you know, they come up to me and they, they tell me this analogy of a car. And they say, I don't need to know how an engine works in order to drive a car, so why would I need brain knowledge in order to teach? Well, there's a very good reason that the skeptics are wrong, and also why this car analogy is wrong. First of all, there's a lot of misconceptions or neuromyths about the brain in education. Part of my job is to give workshops about the brain and learning, and I always start with asking uh, the participants if they agree or disagree with a couple of statements. Let me give you uh, one of these statements. For example, we only use 10% of our brain. Does anybody of you agree? That's a couple. Or another one. We should teach according in a child's, to a child's preferred learning style. I don't know if there's a lot of people agreeing. Yes. Well, the same thing happens in my, in my workshops. So if I ask these teachers these questions, more than half of the teachers raise their hand. Well, actually, these statements are wrong. We use all of our brain all the time, even when sleeping. And this neuromyth is rather harmless in education, but the preferred learning style one isn't. There's never been any proof that teaching in a child's preferred learning style is beneficial for learning. And actually, it can be harmful if you teach in such one-dimensional way. Our brain asks for a rich learning environment, not a poor one. And in order to tell you the second reason why the, um, uh, the skeptics and this car analogy is wrong, so I want to tell you a little bit about how our brain learns. So hang on with me for about two minutes because I'm really getting you know, under the surface of the water and I'm going to tell you a bit about brain plasticity. So take a deep breath, hang on, you know, just about two minutes, a little bit about brain anatomy and physiology. Um, this is our brain. This is a human brain, and it weighs about one and a half kilos. Uh, on average, it's a little bit larger in men, but it doesn't have anything to do with intelligence, unfortunately. <laughs> we have about a billion brain cells, and these brain cells, they're organized in neural networks of about a million cells. And these neural networks, they're flexible, they're dynamic, they can change due to experience. And our brain cells communicate with each other through their many branches. So information enters the cell on one side in the form of an electrical signal, and it leaves the cell on the other side through its axon. And each cell only has one axon, but it branches at the end. So it can connect to as many as 10,000 other neurons. I mean, just imagine. There's a billion cells, and each is connecting to as many as 10,000 other neurons. That's mind-boggling, it's quite stunning. And these cells, they talk to each other in rather, quite a surprising way, because cells that connect actually do not physically touch each other. There's always a small space in between, which is called the synapse. And when an electrical signal is reaching the end of the cell, it stops because it doesn't have anywhere to go. But it triggers the release of a chemical substance called neurotransmitters. It's like serotonin or dopamine. And this substance kind of swims around in the synapse, and then if, if enough of the substance touches the second cell, it triggers a new electrical signal, you know, and the information is spread. And it is this extraordinary way of communicating that makes our brain so flexible. So how does the brain then learn? It's not the formation of new cells or new connections. I mean, how would that look like? There's nobody sitting in your brain, you know, telling this neuron to connect to that neuron when you learn the word synapse. The formation of new connections is only part of the story. Because new connections are formed all the time, but rather in a, in a random fashion. And it's our experience, so the things that we do, the things we feel, the, the things we think, that determine which of these connections survive, which are, are cut away, or which become stronger. And although it may sound a bit counterintuitive, it is this cutting away of the connections that actually makes our neural networks neural networks stronger and more efficient. So in a nutshell, learning is changing the organization of the neural networks in your brain. So far for brain physiology, let's rise above the surface again. So what does that this tell us about the car analogy? 
Are teachers really the drivers of our children's brain? No. They're more of the engineers. Teachers shape the brains of our children. So what does this, uh, this, this information or knowledge about the brain plasticity or flexibility, uh, how does it change the teacher's beliefs? There's not a lot of research on this, but there's been one really beautiful study by Professor Dubinsky in the US, and she shows that when teachers gain a better understanding of the brain and brain plasticity, it actually changes their beliefs and their behavior in the classroom. They start adopting a more child-centered teaching approach. They use more active learning strategies, and better yet, they start believing in the potential of each and every child. And then brain plasticity is only one of the topics from brain science that could be relevant for education. Our knowledge about the plasticity of the brain tells us that you need to use your brain in order to learn. You need to actively construct knowledge, and you need to build on the networks and the, and the knowledge that is already there. That means that our educational system should really make children think. And you can do that in many ways. I mean, you can use inquiry learning, or you can use discovery learning. You can stimulate curiosity. You can relate the topics in your classroom to real-world problems, or you can ask deeper thinking questions. For example, let me ask you a question. Um, I'm going to ask you two questions, and just kind of feel which one activates your brain more. The first one is, describe to me what a camel looks like and how it functions. Or the second question, how should a camel change in order to survive on the North Pole? Well, the second one activates my brain more. <laughs> Our knowledge about the brain also implies that everybody can always get better at a task, whether it's math or language or playing the piano. And this belief that we can always improve our thinking skills and our intelligence has been shown to have a major impact on the learning motivation and the achievement of children. As a former neuroscientist, I was shocked to see how little teachers know about the brain. I mean, learning takes place in the brain, but our teachers are never told how it works, or for that matter, about the more recent theories on learning. We expect our teachers to teach for the 21st century, but at the same time, we equip them with knowledge about learning that is more than 100 years old. It is not simple or very straightforward to apply or translate brain science to education. I mean, if it was, it would have been done already. But our understanding of the brain has taken a flight since the upcoming of modern brain science. And I think we are obliged to see how we can use this knowledge to improve education. And don't get me wrong, our education and our teachers, they have made us what we are today. I mean, we can fly to Mars, and we can, we can replace almost any part in our body if we need to. But just imagine if we could just even better uh, stimulate the potential of each child. And I'm not just talking about math and language performance, but about their motivation for learning, their curiosity, their creative thinking, and the belief they have in themselves. Education is about changing the brain. So teachers, imagine what you can achieve when shaping the brain of your students. Thank you. <laughs>